Welcome to another Advanced Manufacturing Media webinar. Our topic today is Data Management for Engineers, sponsored by Imaginit Technologies. Hello, I'm your host, Bill Koenig, a senior editor of Manufacturing Engineering Magazine, which is part of SME's Advanced Manufacturing Media. Our sponsor today is Imaginit Technologies. Our subject expert is Caleb Funk, Imaginit's Manufacturing Solutions Team Leader. Caleb works as lead consultant and project manager. He has detailed knowledge of Autodesk Vault software and its applications in manufacturing plants across the United States. Imaginit has a dedicated team of data management experts that can help you leverage Autodesk Vault to reduce administrative overhead, free up time for innovation, and enable remotely based employees to work together as if they were in the same facility. Caleb will discuss how engineers and designers can be more efficient and collaborative in real time with Autodesk Vault data management software. Before I turn things over to Caleb, here are some housekeeping items. During this presentation, you will be able to ask questions using the Q&A box that appears at the right of your screen. Following the presentation, and time permitting, your questions will be answered. Time runs out before we can get to all of the questions, we will make sure the answers are emailed to you. And if you experience any audio or visual difficulty during the live presentation, please let us know via the Q&A app. If you have any questions about any aspects, any other aspects of our webinars, please email me at bkoenig at sme.org. Now, here's Caleb Funk to discuss how Autodesk Vault software can be deployed by engineers. All right, thanks, Bill. So what I wanted to look at today, and I'll take a put up a quick agenda here, just some of the things we wanted to talk about. You know, data management itself is a pretty big topic, and there's a lot of different pieces to it. And one of the things we wanted to focus in on was the idea of change control management. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that, some of the things that are driving that, whether it's you know regulation or compliance, you know, engineering requirements that are going to be part of that. And I want to take a look at some example scenarios that um, commonly happen, we see with customers or different things we've heard and worked with. And as Bill mentioned, we do want to open up the end for some Q&A. This is a big topic and there's a lot going on with it. So first, the idea of, you know, what's driving change control? And to some extent, regulation is being forced on more and more industries. Um, and this could come in a couple of different ways, but a lot of times major producers are forcing some sort of compliance on Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 uh, suppliers within there. They're taking that and they're saying, you know what, if you're going to do it, it has to be done a particular way. We need to understand where we're at, you know, when the changes occurred, who made the changes. And of course, we're also seeing uh, government industries that have that same type of compliance thing that they're looking for, where they want to be able to track uh, when things changed, how they changed. And those regulations just seem like they're growing all the time. As you go through and look at the other side of change management, change management, that's kind of the, you know, push, but then there's the pull where we're striving for efficiencies. You know, we've got disconnected processes. Uh, maybe it's the ECO isn't, isn't working with, you know, the engineering change order. It's not being communicated fully throughout the organization. Maybe it's uh, not, there's people who are not uh, in the loop as to what's going on. And then if we have poor change control, it's going to drag down processes that might be efficient, but we don't have a way to push this through in a really great way so that we can understand how all this is working. So I'm mentioning change control, and most companies have some form of it in place already. And usually it's some kind of paper process. And this is based on a, um, you know, we have a paper trail. We can have this process in place. And some people say, well, you know what? We've had this in place. It's been here for years. It's working. Why change it? But the big point that we'd be looking at is not whether a system works or does not work, but how it can be optimized for greater throughput. So it's not just, yep, that works, but what's a way that we can get some more out of that? 
So a lot of times engineering companies, especially since 2008 from what I've seen, it's been trying to get as much as you can out of what's there. And in some cases, cutting overhead, whether it's, you know, that'd be reductions in staff, reductions in software costs, whatever it would be, but trying to go as low as you can. But there's a point that you can't go any lower than because you need those tools, you need those people to get the job done. So what's important is how to optimize the processes that are in place to get the same, uh, to get more, excuse me, out of the same resources. So we want to be able to just, you know, a lot of times I've talked to companies and they said we moved from 2D to 3D. We've gotten every efficiency that we're aware of out of 3D. What's next? Well, it's really, it's the processes that we have. If we can optimize those, that's where a lot of this is going to come into play. So what we're looking at here is kind of a typical change process. This is um, a time frame that we see with a lot of different companies. So in the design portion, in the actual, whether it's the engineering or the drafting portion of it, that, might, that change might go through and be approved and released within a week. But then you know, certification, production processes, these can take a whole lot longer. And those can't start until the initial engineering and drafting, the modeling portion, the documentation, all of that is complete. So a small delay in the engineering group is going to lead to a much longer delay down the line, you know, downstream as we go through. So what we want to do is move away from focusing only on the design team. We need to be able to move this approval process to the team at large, bring all these processes together, and minimize these delays. Now we're looking at the idea of time as it applies to these different processes, but then when we look at costs, it's another way to think about it. And again, the biggest effect is going to be downstream. So as this moves down, you know, a change in production, uh, the, those costs are much higher for a change in production than they would be for a change in the initial design. And I know one thing that everybody kind of works you know, kind of struggles with is the idea of whether you should modify an existing design, create a new design. And it, there are some different ways that that comes in. So, you know, we look at some of these different ideas. Uh, a data management tool can improve traceability. So we can see w where we were with an older design and then how we can pull that together. So we want to try and reuse as much as possible because new design is expensive and it should be avoided. But then we have to have a way to track what we're doing to whether it's revisions on a design or taking that design, copying it to improve it. There's other things that are going to go along with that. Um, we need to make sure that if we do change this design, that you know, we're able to communicate it to everyone else so that everybody involved can be considered. And there's this big idea of engineer to order, uh, ETO. And we'll hear this a lot. We, don't want, we want to be able to engineer to order. We've got a standard-based product, and we want to take that base product and then change it per customer use. But really, we only want to change, we want to engineer as little as possible to order. As much as possible, it's best to have a standard product going out the door just because of the costs associated to it. Also, it, there's, you kind of forget about this sometimes, I know I do, but if I have a new product, which is really just my base product with a couple of changes, um, that new product, or, you know, maybe I re-engineered one because I didn't realize one was so similar, I have to maintain that, my ERP or MRP system. So you can have, an, it's a pretty high cost to maintain just a single item within, within that system over time. So as much as we can use the same components over and over again, that's really one of the best things that we can do. Another big thing driving a lot of this is the idea of lean process engineering. And lean tries to reduce waste in seven key areas. And the idea is to do more with the same resources you already have, but at the same time, increase value to your customer. And it, this is something that never stops. You know, as you get closer and closer to that target, it seems like there's still always something else that we could do. So the target is always moving. And what we're really looking for is near perfection. So we'll never reach that point where it's completely lean, where we, there's no errors, where we be, we're able to reduce all of this. The transportation line is perfect. Everything is, you know, we've reduced the wait times to zero. It's very difficult to get to a true frictionless environment like that. 
So lean always ser searches for near perfection as it goes through there. So some of the things that we have, this idea of reducing cost, eliminating waste, uh, reducing lead time, uh, these are things that we have to think of as a one whole team where everyone kind of un sees this and understands that together. And any information in this process end to end has to be more accurate and available than it was before. So that any possible optimization uh, in the process, this is what we you know, want. We want to optimize that. And by optimizing the change management process, that will have a big impact on what we're working with. Now, lean isn't the only thing that we're uh, concerning ourselves with or working with. There's several other uh, items that are driving this. Sarbanes-Oxley, obviously, has been a big one. Um, ISO has been a big part of that. And all of these really come down to the idea of control, in some level, control of documents and an understanding of an audit trail as to where things have been. So I want to talk about just a few of these a little bit. Um, ISO's 9000 is one that comes up, and there's a few things that, uh, some misconceptions about it. Uh, so a lot of people think, well, it's just a European standard. It's only for larger companies, and it's not really true. Uh, it really only requires that you have a simple, logical quality system that everyone works to and is well documented. And it, the system does provide 20 template scenarios to help with this idea of implementation and validation, you know, and then there's people that you can become ISO certified for that. And there's a lot of information around that. But one of the key things is, is to have a process, to have it documented, and to follow it every single time. And then Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, this is one that comes up a lot as well. It really comes down to the idea about corporate governance and, uh, and the idea that you think about is financial irregularities, right? Sarbanes-Oxley came out of what happened with Enron, so that's where the focus is. But that's not the only consideration with it. Any actions by any level of staff have to be visible so that people at the corporate level have an understanding of what's going on. What it really comes down to with Sarbanes-Oxley is the corporate level is ultimately responsible. So whether it's in engineering, whether it's in you know, the manufacturing side or the financial side, they have to be aware of it, have access to that information, and understand where it's at. And again, I've got a few links there that uh, just go to some of the different things for compliance and some other uh, components for that. Uh, FDA. This is, again, this is another one that drives this quite a bit. This is about the validation of systems. Um, so it's really proving what happened, whatever it was, a change within the organization, a change to the design, was in accordance with policy. Can you, you, know, can you prove that we did this change in accordance with the policy that we had in place? And if you don't have a, some type of system that's tracking that, this becomes more and more difficult to do. The idea of the ability to discern altered records so that you can go back and say this was released on this date and we know that it wasn't changed. We, we have a way of understanding if uh, a change has occurred to something because it only works with certain steps in a certain order. And that's really part of what Vault can bring to us is the idea that we can lock things down, that we have a very specific change process that we're going to go through, and that that change process will, we will follow every single time as we go through it. So it's going to be the same every single time. Now, one thing that we do get asked is if our system is uh, FDA compliant or is it ISO compliant. But um, here in the FDA website, this is just a little extract that I have here, because a, you know, they even say, look, a vendor can't guarantee that this is going to be FDA Part 11 compliant. And it's because of the way that um, these things change and they update. If a software was fully compliant, no changes could ever be made to the software without the approval of the FDA. So while we don't have that level, we can't say it's not fully compliant, we do have um, technical elements that are in there to support that process. That's a big part of what Vault has. So we can use Vault to meet FDA compliance, but on the surface, there really isn't any tool out there that is 
or that is ISO or FDA compliant as is. So I talked a little bit about some of the things that are driving the need to have a process in place, to understand how that process is documented, and begin going through that. Now I want to step back and kind of talk about some of the engineering requirements that we have. So if I look at all of the different types of things that go into a design, this is everything from the documentation from CAD files, and that's really the world that I came from. I came out of, um, I was a design drafter, started on the board years ago. And if I look at that, that's what I think of. When I think of engineering requirements, it comes down to I've got my uh, drawings, I've got my CAD model, I'm good. But there's a lot of other pieces that go into it. It could be FEA analysis. It could be stand, uh, specs and standards that go with part of that. It could then be taking those machines and putting them into a factory layout. Uh, it could be in, um, imagery that we're going to put into a marketing event. So there's a lot of different pieces to that. The preference would be to have a tool that can manage all of those different types of drawings. Because if we're just managing engineering, we're missing out on a big portion of that and we're not tying it together. So if we do have those different types, um, if we're looking at different processes, a process for approving uh, something fairly simple, like maybe we need to process a um, just a really simple release of a technical publication. So we've got a pre-design review, and then it's work in progress, and then we review it, and then it's released. So that would be a pretty simple process that we could go through. And there may be documents in the organization that go through exactly that type of process. However, when we're looking at a full machine, we've got this more complex CAD model, we might have other things that we need to review as well. Uh, whether it's certified electrically, the customer is going to have to look at it, talk to the subcontractors, uh, may we have part of it done externally by another firm, and so it's going to go through a lot more stages. So what we want to be able to do is manage those multiple types of requests and those multiple processes within the same system. Another one that comes in is the idea of tight delivery deadlines. And Sometimes there's certain components, whether it's for an external vendor or maybe you know, we're sending it to a specialty shop to be created. We want to release the full product when the full design is done, but there's other portions of it that need to be pre-released. They need to go out early. We don't want to edit them while they're in pre-release, but we also don't want to release them to the shop floor yet. So whether it's for ordering, whether it's for someone else to work on, there's all kinds of situation where this occurs. And we still need to know about and deal with those components when we do a full production. So that sometimes can be a headache to manage as to what portion it's in and where it's at. And the most common tool I've seen to measure some of this information and to track a lot of this information is a, an Excel spreadsheet. I've seen a lot of those where you know, yellow means it's pre-released, um, red means it's behind or whatever. There's all these different you know, color codings and going through. It's a very manual tool that's uh, tracking all of that. So there's another one that we run into as well is changes coming from either procurement, from outside vendors, or from the shop floor. So we need a way to record those requests even if they're not approved for change. So it's possible someone comes in and gives us some information. We say, well, that's a great idea, but I don't think we're going to be following through on that one you know, right now, maybe not with this model, or maybe we just shoot it down completely. But we still need to track that a request was made. And then we have an issue where sometimes there's a change that needs to be done urgently. Maybe a problem has been found during the production of an order. It's on the floor. We need to be able to bring people from several places, have access to those changes to be able to approve them. We need to lock it down while it's going through the change. Um, we can't keep chasing people in the design office down for a print. There's got to be a, a way to send this information through. And um, there have been issues with that, and I've seen it where we, there's a progress meeting and people start discussing a drawing or discussing a print, and all of a sudden, everybody realized they have different prints of the same drawing, and they're all at the same revision level. 
so no one's sure suddenly whose rev C is right because that wasn't traced through, changes were made at some point, possibly because, hey, we got to get this out, but all of a sudden it gets out of sync. So to drive efficiency, we have to be on top of that problem and control where that's going to go. So we've got some of the, we've got the engineering process that's driving it. We've got compliancy that's also driving it. So we've got the two different sides that are part of that and holding it in place. What I want to go through are a few example scenarios of what this might look like, things that I've actually seen or actually dealt with with customers that we've run into. And I'm going to be showing a little bit of how Autodesk Vault is going to deal with some of those scenarios. So in this case, I'm going to, I've got a boxer motor assembly. It'll be the example for the scenarios. And this is an inventor model with drawings. So we've got all of our engineering documentation associated with it. And it's going to be managed by Autodesk Vault. And then we'll take a look at some case scenarios of how different things that come up and how Vault handles those different portions. And I kind of outlined them as I was going through uh, what we had seen a little bit there. So one of them, and this is always kind of a, uh, an issue, is we might have multiple document types that we're going to go through. And multiple document types have to be managed in different ways. So it could just be a Word document, it could be a PowerPoint file, it could be the Excel spreadsheet that contains a whole lot of product information on it. Those are very common. I think Excel is probably the most commonly used engineering tool, and I've, it, I've seen so many Excel spreadsheets, and they don't even have any calculations in them. It's just a great way to hold that tabulated information. But let's talk a little bit about how we can go through and use Vault to manage different document types. So Vault is a CAD, it's based off of a CAD tool. It works with uh, the CAD items, but it can also work with all kinds of different things. And when I say that, any file type really can go into Vault. And what I'm doing here is I'm going through and taking a look at this. I've got a, a basic release process that I can work with in Vault. And I've got a release part that locks everybody out of it, and then all the rest, everyone's allowed into it. So I've created a category called Office that handles Office documents. Then I've gone through and assigned that Office category to Excel documents, Word documents, PowerPoint files, and it's actually an automatic rule that's going to run for me. So anytime I check in a document from Word, from PowerPoint, from Excel, it's going to automatically flag it as an Office document, and it's going to automatically give it the right life cycle that it can run through. So I'll check this one in. We've got some technical publications here. This is just showing a, um, the components there and how they're going to go together, some assembly instructions, some PowerPoint slides. And again, this will be checked into Vault. So those files are checked into Vault, and they enter Vault in a work-in-progress state. So it's a work-in-progress file. Notice the red icon. It's already been flagged as a Office type of file. And if I want to, I do have previewers in here. I can go in and see the information. Um, obviously, since we just checked it in, we should know what it is. But anyone else who's reviewing this can take a look at that information and see that. So these files have already been flagged as Office files. I can view them in here. I can see the information. And they're in a work-in-progress state. Well, because it's an Office file, because I've already assigned a specific uh, workflow to that, I can now put them, change it from being work in progress, I can go and switch that out to released files. And again, it's a simple process that I have. It's work in progress or it's released. Now, as soon as we release that file, there's going to be a lock that goes on it. That file is no longer editable because it is a locked file. That's going to be true whether it's a CAD file, whether it's a uh, Office file like we're seeing here. It really could be anything. But we're able to apply those lifecycle states to it so that we can lock it down and no one else can edit it. 
So Vault Professional has the tools to allow me to apply those life cycles to those different document types. And we can, have, we can have all kinds of different categories. I've got some customers who even have different categories for their CAD files. Some might be fabrication, some might be general arrangement, and those may have different rules associated to them. So I mentioned that I locked that file down. I went through and I was able to lock that file down, and we saw the little padlock that appears next to it, and no one can edit that file. The only way to edit that file, typically, is to move it from released back to work in progress. If that happens, the revision will automatically bump for me. So it's going to handle the revision control as part of that. However, it does sometimes happen where you've got a file. This would be a CAD file that we put in there, and it's missing a dimension. There's no change to the CAD geometry, there's a misspelling or one missed dimension or whatever. We don't want to rev that drawing just for that particular dimension. Now I say that, I have had a few customers who said, oh yeah, we always rev it no matter what we do. And that's fine, we can control that as well. But more often than not, we say, oh, there's one thing missing, I don't want to have to rev this file. So here, what I'm going to do is within Vault, this gives us the flexibility to work in a lot of different ways. So let's take a look at our release process that we have through here. And this has a few more options in it. It starts out in work in progress, and then it can go to a few different things. And I can even have rules where it checks for certain things. It'll check to see if the properties are correct. It'll check for different items. Well, in this case, I can say, well, when this goes from, released, from, work in pro from release to work in progress, bump the revision. However, I have another one called Quick Change. And when it goes from released to Quick Change, do not bump that rev. So Quick Change is a state that I have available within here that I can go to so that I don't have to worry about bumping it, and it's going to, but it is going to allow me to edit the particular file. So let's take a look at a file where I need to make a change to. And again, I'll use the previewer within here so you can kind of see this information. And if I take a look, I don't have a center to center distance on that particular file there. You know, I've, I've got the overall, but not a center to center. Well, this is a great understanding of how Inventor integrates with this. This file can be opened in Inventor. And when I initially open it, it's going to be a read only file. I can't edit it. It is locked down. I can't change it but I need to add that one dimension. So I don't even have to be in Vault. From Inventor, I can put this in a quick change state. And there's some default things, whether it's a typo or what other comments I want to add to that. In this case, we'll add a dimension. Then I'm going to check that file out, which means I now have control of it. And now I'll come along and add in just a quick dimension here so that we've got the center to center distance between those two. The file will be checked in, it will be saved as it goes, and now we'll be back in Vault with a file at the same revision that it's at now, however it's going to have that update that I needed to apply to it. So all from the CAD tool, I'm able to get the file that I need from Vault, set it to the correct state, and then begin working on it within here. And now I can even preview those two different uh, components that I had, those two different views. So here we can see I've got the one where I am showing the second dimension that I added. However, I can also view uh, older versions of that where I don't have the dimension that I added. So that's a really common one, the ability to have, you know, we want to have that flexibility where we can move between you know, a completely locked down file and then a file that we can begin uh, having a little more, you know, flexibility to say, oh, I need to make a quick change to that. And we can limit that in a couple different ways. I have seen that in the past limited to only um, CAD managers can set it to a work and pro, excuse me, can set it to a quick change. So if you mess up, you got to go talk to your boss and ask him, to, hey, I need to add that one dimension. So we can control that security at a very granular level. It's a great way to set that up.
So another thing that we have, and this is a really common one that we'll see as well, is I've got an exhaust manifold in here. Um, then those need a while to produce and then test, and they have to go out before the rest of my motor design is going to be completed. So I want to pre-release those. And this is what you saw before when I was releasing some tech pubs and things. It was really simple. It was work in progress or it was released. Well, now as I look in here, I'm going to have a more complicated flow. And part of what that flow is going to contain is the ability to set files uh, to a pre-release state. And I'm actually going to do this as part of a change order. So Vault does have change orders that are built into it. And I'm selecting these particular documents that I have. Um, I can take this information and see the files that are part of that. I can even preview them in here in the 3D format. Vault has a specific viewable that's available as part of this within here so we can see that information. So what I want to do is I'm going to release these items. And Vault uh, Professional has a tool called Items that allows for that. We're going to add those items to the particular change order. Items are a little different than files. Items will contain not only the uh, file itself, maybe the IPT, the inventor part file, but additional information. So it's been created, and now we'll go ahead and push that to be an open change request. And to kind of sped this up here, it's just going through and adding a couple more items, adding the drawings in as part of that. And now it's part of this open change request, we can go through and change the state. So it was work in progress. Now we're going to set it to a pre-release state. So now these files could be, whether we want to release them to a particular department, but not to the general, you know, complete design isn't released. We have the ability to set that to pre-release so that people can begin working with it. And it'll even flag those and put a watermark on them so everyone understands they're in a pre-release state. Now, that was in an open state. What I'm going to do is just submit that all the way to the end. It was just a release that I wanted to do. And it's part of the flexibility of the tools that we have. That There are steps, and I'll walk through some of those in a moment. But for right now, I just want to set the effectivity of that and close that out. Those files are now pre-released. And anyone who has access to pre-released files can see that information. Because I used an ECO as part of that, Anyone who was on that ECO routing would also be informed via email and via a link to the vault that those files have been pre-released and are ready to go. Okay, so we were able to take those files, walk through a pre-release, again, a kind of a common scenario that we would have. The final one is kind of an extended scenario, and this is where the shop floor notices a problem. And they say, you know what, we think this could be done to fix this. That design change needs to be communicated to the change administrators. It's going to need to be communicated to the people who make the change, the actual people who make the change, and then we'll also need to then communicate that back, that it's been completed and that it's done. So this is going to go through quite a few different things. We'll see redlining that's going to be part of this, the communication that's part of this, and then the ability to use email to send some of this information through. So in this instance, the shop floor uh, can start viewing these files that are in here, not in Vault, but in a web browser that links to Vault. And this is a viewable of the CAD model that's in here. And they are able to take that and redline it up and pass some information on. Now, there's different redline tools for drawings and for models, but that information could be redlined and passed back. Now, to start an actual uh, change request or to look at anything like that, we will have to go to the Vault client. So here in the Vault client, we're able to view the redline, see the information, and I can take it a little further if I want to. That can be opened up in Design Review, and different files can be turned on or turned off so we can see exactly the information that's there. 
And again, that's not the CAD model, that's just a viewable. So as we take a look at that, we say, okay, well, we see what they're talking about. Let's go ahead and apply a change order to that. So now, I'll go ahead and create a new change order. And this one I'll walk through a few more things with. I'll create this change order, and I've got specific properties that I can have as part of that. And all I picked up was just that air box that I had, just the lower section of it. And I can add additional files to that. Any files that we have within Vault, we can continue to attach to that. So in this case, we'll attach that red line as well. So we know the basic component that we need to edit, and we can see the red line that goes along with that. Now, we saw this status earlier, the different places that it could go, and we'll see in a minute the routing that that could possibly go through. So a change has been requested, and now the change administrator can determine what needs to be done with that. If we're going to move that forward, if we're going to, uh, if any other files need to be edited. So the change request could come from the shop floor so that that could be viewed. And now all of the related files to that, any assemblies that are part of that, any, uh, any drawings that are part of that, all of that can be added to the change request. Vault understands those relationships and it's very easy to go get the related files and add them in. So now, this, it's been created and it's been submitted. It's now an open request that's within here. And we'll add some comments in, and these comments can even be added to the email that goes out with that. Vault can be configured to work with your email server, and we'll email everyone involved with the change, whether they are responsible for something or just reviewing it, the information that they need. So this is the routing that it's going to go through. And we can assign different people different privileges at um, each stage of that. There might be some people who are responsible for editing the files, others who are just responsible for checking the files. So we've got a specific routing that it's going to go through and different people in each of those different categories. So as we move it through these states, different people will be assigned to each of those states. And we can set it so that it is uh, everyone has to agree to the states, you know, multiple people have to agree before it moves on, or just a single person out of a group could agree to it. In this case, I'm adding some additional markup information, adding that to the email, and we'll push this along. So now we'll move it from where we, uh, what we had into a work state. Remember before we just did a quick, hey, we're going to release these, let's push that through and push it along. Now we're moving through these stage gates so that people can review, check, edit, and update this information. So now the next person in line, the engineer who's been assigned to this, gets to log in, can see this information, it's on his work list, can see all of the files associated to that ECO, and take a look at that. So now, Inventor could be opened up so that we can begin making edits to that information. So we'll open that file in Inventor, and we're actually looking right at the red line within Inventor and can see that information. And it understands that it's part, you know, it's associated to a drawing. We can see where that's going. And because it's being controlled by an ECO, we now have permission to change the state of it. And again, once the state changes to work in progress for us to make some changes, we can edit that. Now, another great thing about Vault is the ability to visually see how some of this works together. So I'm able to see what files are controlled by a change graphically. And if once it'll map that information you know, what's controlled by a change, what's not controlled by a change, right over there to my model. And this could be a whole series of reports. We could see what's released, what's not released, you know, what state are we in. But in this case, I want to take that component and move it to work in progress so that we can begin to edit it. Now here I've sped this up a little bit. This is just kind of working through some inventor-based items and making a few changes to the component itself. Once we've gone through this, made the changes, made the updates, uh, we've got it right where we need it to be, that can now be checked back into Vault once we're done. Those updates pass through, 
We've got the information updated and changed. The drawing will update and change. And now we can go to the red line on here and check that off. That red line has been completed. So in this case, we had a single red line, but if there were multiple, we could check each of them off in turn and say, okay, now that one's done, now that one's done. So the change has been made. We're able to take that information. It's a work in progress. It bumped the revision that's on it. And I'll go ahead now and switch those files back. And see, these are ready for review. And I'll move the ECO on through so that it's ready for the reviewer. So very similar to, you know, uh, what we saw with the first one where we pushed it to the work state, we can now push it to a review state. Again, an email will go out to the person responsible for reviewing. And it could, we can also set it up so that we can have people who participate, maybe they're not directly responsible for reviewing, but they need to be aware of the process that's going on. So they can get an email just letting them know, hey, this is now moved to the next state. This is now in the review state. We can also go back at any time and see what state is that in. We can run reports to see how many ECOs do we have in the review state. So we can get an understanding of where that information is, who's got it, and who's responsible for the next step. So now we can see it's moved through these. It's currently in review. And we're just playing the reviewer here to go through, take a look at the files, you know, check them essentially, see that the correct information was checked off, you know, we've got what we need to have, and then push it on to the next phase. So once this has been reviewed and we agree, say, okay, that's fine. Let's send it on for final approval. And this is typically the change administrator, uh, someone who's responsible for keep, keeping track of the flow of changes, someone who's responsible for both saying, yes, this is a change that we'll allow for, and then the finalization here, where we have it released and then completed. So that flow is very common, taking that information, sending it back through, and having all of that in place. Now here at the end, we're at revision B of that, and that information, again, is being reviewed in the Vault Web Client. So now we can see that we don't have the interference that we did before. That change is always tracked by the Vault system. It's always uh, within there. If I took a look at that file, I could see any change orders against it. If I took a look at any change orders, I could see any files that it was put against. So it's bi-directional, and we can look at that in two different ways. So Vault gives us a place where we can track those changes, understand where the information is, and keep and be able to refer back to that at a later date so we can see exactly who did what when and who had access to those files. So what we wanted to go through with this session is just talk a little bit about how regulation is kind of pushing and production efficiency is pulling uh, companies to it's really driving them to show the value of good change management. I wanted to talk about some of the basic issues that we had. You know, some of those things that we ran through. And, you know, the, you know just managing a change as it goes through, pre-releasing files. And I wanted to show how having that strong engineering change-based data management solution, big word, but the idea of being able to track all of that through there, how we can f have efficient changes and traceability, which is a key part to that. And there's a lot of other different types of things that it will handle, you know, the multiple documents, the simple workflows, the complex workflows, simple change requests, pre-releases, all of that is a part of the Vault tool that we have. So I appreciate your time and attention uh, for listening to me today, and I'll pass it right now back over to Bill. Hi, this is Bill Koenig joining you again. Caleb, thanks for the insights. We have received some questions, so let's get to them. Our company uses different tech terminology than what you showed in the demo. For example, we say a drawing is complete instead of released. Can Vault be configured to use different terms? Oh, sorry, I had myself on mute just for a second. Yes, it absolutely can. So um, I've done I've done some really interesting things with that. 
out of the box, we have some templates that are in there, and that's where we see the pre-release and the released and obsolete. It's kind of some standard things. However, other companies I've had had different levels of that. Um, in one case, we had nine different levels that it had to pass through, and they had very different names from what you saw. So that's easily configurable. And one I saw just the other day that was kind of neat. It was a uh, they were using it to track, and they would mark files as 33% complete, 66% complete, 99% complete. So it wasn't just a release. They could go through and say, how many files on this project are at the 66% complete point? And they had project managers who were going in and updating that so they could see that information. And that was just a life cycle like we saw with the others. So it's a great way to manage that in a couple different ways. So. Short answer is absolutely. We can configure that in a wide variety of ways. We can even put different levels of security on the different ones. So maybe at 66% complete, only a certain group is allowed to edit from there or whatever else. So thanks for the question. Okay. Can routings for changes be defined on the go or are they fixed? So with the routings, you saw where we were able to say, well, I want a engineering change routing or I want a initial release routing. And those are templates that you can define and say certain people are always part of this routing, certain people are always part of this one. However, people do go on vacation, people do get sick. So yeah, it's absolutely possible to pick one of the defaults and then remove or add people to that default and choose the, what role they'll play at that time. So yeah, definitely possible. Okay. What is the first step in implementing a change management tool like Vault? So it's debatable. Um, I think the first step really comes down to understanding what your process is now. Um, so getting someone, uh, a consultant a group like Imagine It involved absolutely is beneficial. But what we'll do when we get there is ask, well, what do you do now? <laughs> so documenting what those steps look like as much as you can on the front end, really understanding what your process is today, that's definitely beneficial for down the line. So to me, that's always the first thing is what do we do today? Or let's document that. You know, Put it into Visio or just into Word, whiteboard it out so that there's an understanding of these are the processes we go through. A lot of times when that happens, you can begin to see where some of the difficulty lies. Say, okay, well, you know, the process goes like this, but we also need to keep this group in, informed and that doesn't really happen or whatever else it is. So detailing out your current process is usually the first step. Now, that's something we can definitely uh, help you with, but it's a great exercise for you to go through on your own. At the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned how some people, it's you know, we've done it on paper, it's worth for a long time, why change? How quickly have you, in your experience, how quickly do people adapt to Vault? It ranges across the board. Uh, depending on the size of your organization, the complexity of your environment, a lot of those different types of things. Uh, Vault implementation isn't nearly as long as I've seen with, say, an ERP implementation or something like that. ERP implementation sometimes literally can take years. Uh, Vault, for what I'll call a mid-sized company, we've got 10 engineers, you know, 10 to 15 engineers, getting that put into place, getting best practices put into place and set up, imagine it can typically um, do that in two to three weeks in terms of the software portion, the configuration portion, and the training portion. From there, actually, you know, really starting to use it, part of that's going to come from being driven by uh, the engineering management or even higher up so that we have, you know, we definitely are using the system, let's move into it. It definitely helps to have that fully configured and ready to go. The easier it is to move to the system, the quicker people will adapt to it. What I would typically see is you would see those three, those three weeks, two to three weeks of getting it installed, and then you would see anywhere from you know two to three months where it's just an integral part of what you do every single day of your life. Uh, we actually used it internally for some documents we were handling, and it was that was just the first thing I did in the morning was log into Vault, see what I had to do today. Okay. Well, unfortunately, our time is running short. We'd like to thank Caleb Funk of Imagine It Technologies for sharing his time and knowledge with us. And we'd like to thank you, our listeners, for joining us as well. 
All unanswered questions will be passed along to Imagine it <coughs> Technologies, and you can expect a reply via email. The entire webinar will be available for replay by 4 p.m. Eastern Time today, and you can access it by using the same sign-in link you used earlier. As this webinar has shown, and as we've been hearing with increasing frequency, manufacturing is getting smarter. A new magazine produced by SME, Smart Manufacturing, was launched in May to help educate manufacturing professionals about the, about the new and emerging technologies used to make things in this digitally connected era, known as the Fourth Industrial Revolution or Industry 4.0. Readers can find that first issue at www sme.org slash smart and learn how to subscribe to the new publication. Advanced Manufacturing Media delivers the latest additive, additive and manufacturing news at www.advancedmanufacturing.org. We cover all sorts of manufacturing. If you haven't bookmarked it, please do. And thanks for joining us for this Advanced Manufacturing Media webinar. We hope you found it informative.